This is the 18th video in the video series of Orbital Mechanics of Python. This one, I'm going to be going over the end body perturbation software. So, as I said in the last video, I'm starting to start splitting up my videos. So, the last one was a theory, and this one's going to be the actual software application. And just a real quick uh, kind of reminder for the geometry of what we're going to do. We need to be able to calculate this R sat2 body, which is a vector that's pointing from the satellite to whatever nth body you want to do. And I'm going to be doing the moon um, for this example. And in the future, I'll also do more examples when, say, you're going interplanetary and you want to take into account the perturbations from, say, Jupiter or Neptune to the big planets. And so from that geometry, and then we get the dynamics, as I showed the paper in the last video. Um, you can just check out the last video if you want a quick refresher. And the lunar orbit, because I'm going to be doing the lunar example, there's a quick nuance that you have to know with the inclination of the moon with respect to Earth's equator. So this is a little moon fact sheet. Uh, NASA has a bunch of these for all the planets, I would assume. Um, and so it has a bunch of uh, physical properties in comparison to the Earth. Um, so you can see stuff like mass, volume, then J2, um, something that's important when you're over there. And then orbital parameters, you can see the semi-major axis, perigeology, all that. But what's important here is the uh, inclination to ecliptic versus the inclination to Earth equator. So the ecliptic, um, I think I mentioned this before, is the ecliptic is a plane of the orbit of the Earth with respect to the Sun, where and that is different from the plane uh, of the equatorial, the equatorial plane, so how the Earth is rotated with respect to how it's orbiting the Sun, which is why we have seasons. So these are very different values, so you have to make sure you're using the right one, and I'll show you how to do that in the spice files, because you need to load the spice file in the correct frame. So, lunar, and then some test cases. So I have geostationary satellite, and I also have an ISS example, so you can see kind of the difference between kind of what a geostationary satellite would see versus the ISS, which is in low Earth orbit. Um, and then one quick thing I wanted to mention is that this R, CB to NV can sometimes be ignored um, because, say, if you want to, if you're at Earth orbit and you want to model the pole of, say, Jupiter, uh, the difference between, so the difference between um, R, sat to body and R, CB to NB is really small in that case, so sometimes you just ignore it and just use R, CB to NB. You can do that, it just depends how much uh, kind of accuracy you want, because it'll just reduce the computational load, and sometimes you're looking for that. So, getting to the Python, uh, V18. So, oh, what are you doing? Um, have all the usual stuff. Uh, one thing you have to put in is a date. Um, and the way that I like to pass in the end bodies, so you have the typical perts perturbations, um, like before, and then this end bodies. Um, variable, you're going to just put in a list of whatever bodies you want, where each value in the list is going to be a dictionary, like the ones that are here. So this PD is from here, or import planetary data is PD. So you have all these uh, values, basically. You have Earth and the Moon. In this case, it's going to be the Moon, um, where the Moon has a spice file. And in this case, these are all the same spice file, all the same thing, um, because that D432S file has all of these. But for other cases, you could use different spice files. So you don't always know which spice file you're going to load, so you have to be able to account for that, um, which is just another entry here in these. So. Yeah, so you make the list, and then you just pass in the list as a perturbation. Um, so what's the more important part of this is going to be what's actually an orbit propagator. So there's going to be a few things that change in the init function, because you need to load in, load in these, these values. So everything's the same up to here, and then here. So if self.perts and bodies or self.perts SRP, which I'm going to do SRP in the next video, so I'll just cover that as well. But this, I just have it all kind of integrated into one. So if you have any of these, which means if you're going to load in any spice data, uh, first load in the leap seconds kernel, because you're always going to need that, basically. And then add it to a list here that I have of spice files that have been loaded. Because if you already loaded, say, the DU432S file, you don't want to load it again because it takes like a second or two, and you might as well just not do that. Um, and I initialize that list just uh, here. It's just super simple. Just make it an empty list, and then you're just going to add to the list. So your start time is going to be, you're going to turn whatever date zero that you passed in into the seconds after J2000. Um, I think I showed this function before. If not, um, you can just look up on the SpicyPy documentation. I'll, I'll put another link in the description, but just to kind of see how all these functions work. And then the time span for this is going to be lin space from the start time to the end times, which is the start time plus T span, and then however many steps you're going to do. So that just gets you kind of the array of times that you need. I think I, I showed that example in the plotting of the orbits of the planets. And I'll do this one in the next video for SRP, but for here, so for body in self.perts and bodies, 
Um, and you notice that it's outside of this. So if there's no um, end bodies, then just this doesn't run and it doesn't matter. So I like to have that in a for loop because if it's an empty list and nothing happens, then that's what we want. So for each body, if the body spice file isn't in already in the spice file loaded, so if the file hasn't already been loaded, go ahead and load it. So spice.furnish, whatever the spice file is, and then add it to the list that's been loaded. And then you're going to want to store internally here the body. You just create a states variable is where you get the ephemeris data, and you have the typical inputs I have here. I, I showed the example in the, in the plotting of the solar system video there. And that's it for as far as loading this data. And then from... And then, as far as the differential equation, right here, you get through the perturbations, and then, for, again, it's in a four body in the body. So for each body in the end body perturbations are set to body, um, which is how I said in the previous video. It's just a little vector addition. In this case, we subtract the R vector from uh, the R, C, B, to N, B, or R from the body, yeah, from the body. And then you calculate the C, B, to N, B. Or, no, you have the CB20 there, break. See, that's not... Oh, I should just change that. Because RCB20B... Oh, yeah, I could just have this be above, like this. And then, because this is just the same thing right here. So this can be R... This is more readable this way. RCB2NB. Like that. And then, as I showed in the dynamics equation um, from that paper uh, I showed in the last video, this is just the equation that you're going to want in order to calculate that um, nth body acceleration vector. Just like that. Pretty straightforward once you actually just put it into the software. And yeah, I think that's it for the orbit propagator because that's all the things that I changed. Oh, actually, one thing. So, just plain, just uh, as usual. And then one thing I want to... I had to change in this because I was getting some kind of results that didn't make sense to me um, when I was using the propagator L soda, which is what I usually use because it's a lot faster. Um, so I was getting some weird results, and I tried it with this, and these results look more intuitive as to what I was thinking. So I'm going to have to look deeper into that because that is the case that sometimes when you have a different differential equation solver, you will get a different answer. So I'm going to have to dig deeper into that because I don't exactly know what the whole cause of it is. I have to look at kind of what is the algorithm that the other l -Soda uses, that Dopey 5, the RK45 doesn't. Um, so I have to look deeper into that. But for this one, I just use this Dopey 5, so it takes a little bit longer to run. And then for Calculate Cos, um, I'm going to get to this in a future video, but you can, this is a par parallelizable um, kind of function because you just have um, just a number of basically uh, calculations you need to do and you can parallelize them. You don't have to run them in sequential order. Um, and I'll get that to another video, just not in this one. But um, what I wanted to show for the calculate codes is that I actually switched over to a spicy pie version of this. Uh, TRV to codes and then in tools, RV to codes. I changed it to, wait, no, oh, wrong one. Uh, spice, so this is spice.oscltx. Um, you don't really have to do that for now. Um, I'll make a video just on doing this, on um, using the spicy pie function. Uh, and the reason I changed to it is because it's faster. Um, I just found that it gave me the same results and it was running considerably faster. And that's likely because it's actually running in C and not in Python. So I'm just gonna, I just kept it like that. And then I'll, I'll, I'm gonna make a video about it just so I can make it more clear. But as of now, I'm just using this and it just calculates faster. And that's pretty much it. So usual, uh, just orbit propagator class, and then calculate and plot codes, and then plot in orbits. And one thing I, I want to show for this is because I'm going to put this side by side with orbit propagator because I'm getting the ephemeris data of the moon um, from within the orbit propagator class because it was already calculated. So here in the init function, so body states. So this is uh, so within the perturbations dictionary in orbit propagator in the end bodies, you actually you store all the state variables. So you can grab that out here too. So you already stored all the variables, so you can get them. And it's this is kind of like a long little operation. Um, but what it is, is OP0, and then PERT, so perturbations, end bodies, 0. Because you know it's the 0th body, there's only one value in here, so it's a 0th value. And then states, and the states has a position and velocity, so just get every row, and then the first three columns which will just give you the rx, ry, rz. 
Um, it's, a, yeah, it's a bit of a lot of indexing there, but that's just all that's doing. Um, and it's saying opiss.rs, op0.rs, all that, and then iss, geo, and moon. So, I'm, yeah, I'm going to have a big plot. So, you can see kind of... Um, also, the, the moon has a pretty wonky orbit, so I actually wanted to show that as well. Um, there, that's it. And then, how long do I have this? Yeah, so this is going for 100 days because this perturbation does take a little bit to see. Um, and it might not look too significant, but... The differences that you're going to see in the codes for the geostationary satellites are actually really important because they they are put in a very specific place. So because they're geostationary, they're over one point of the Earth at all times. So if they deviate from that. Um, that's a big problem for them. So this is something that they really have to model, especially because they're so far out there. So that major axis is about 43,000 kilometers. So that's really far away, and that's closer to the moon than, say, an ISS, which is what I want to show. Um, and one thing you're going to see, this is going to take a little bit to run because my computer is getting pretty hot and it's uh, using this method, the JOP5, instead of the LSOTA. So what you're going to see is that you're going to see that the moon's, inc so for geostationary, it's basically um, a circular uh, with zero inclination orbit with respect to the Earth's equator and the moon is very inclined. So this perturbation is actually going to change the inclination of um, whatever satellite you have, if it's close to that value. But if it's, um, say, ISS, which has an inclination of about like 50 degrees or something, um, it's going to be a little bit different. So you're going to see that in the um, in the codes plot. Um, yeah, this is taking a well, while. I'm not surprised. It's my computer thought. And then, as I said, this method is actually quite a bit slower. So we'll just wait on that. And let's see, anything else? Oh, yeah, and the date uh, matters. So I have it as today, the 23rd. Uh, yeah, um, the date matters because uh, the certain day will make a difference in where the moon is. So if, say, today the moon is going to be a different place than tomorrow or like an hour from now. So you need to have that very specific um, date and time in order to be able to get the accurate ephemeris data that you want. And let's see, anything else? Oh, and I guess I, I could mention this now as far as uh, parallelization. Um, it's about, so most computers, uh, not most, but you can, it depends on what computer you have. A lot of them have like, say, four, four to seven cores. Uh, and what the parallelization allows you to do is kind of use all the cores at the same time. Because the way that it's being implemented now, it's only using one core. And it's just going sequentially, just calculate um, the codes for this one and this one and this one all the way down. Where instead, you can take advantage of multiple cores and say you can cut your time in half or even better than that um, just depends on kind of like the algorithm that they use for parallelization and how many um, kind of jobs you send out to all your cores um, this is taking longer than i expected but oh shoot i don't know why i didn't save and i was running i was running a different case for um for a thousand days so that's probably why it's taking so long hopefully you can get through this yeah, because I was getting, that was the weird results that I was getting, so I, I tried running it for a thousand days instead of a hundred, um, just to see kind of what was going on, and I was able to kind of uh, reconcile those differences with the uh, LSOTA propagator. Okay, yeah, that's definitely faster. Also, I had to make the, um, the DT smaller for uh, ISS, because if I make the DT 5000, like the GEO, um, so the that's over an hour, and... Um, the period of ISS or low Earth orbit is about 90 minutes, so that's very significant into a period, so I didn't want to make it that big, so I want to make it smaller, which 1,000 seconds is, uh, that's a lot less than an hour. Um, what is that? That's, uh, 60, it's about 15 minutes-ish, I think. Doing some quick mental math. And that's also why it's taking longer, the, the ISS one is taking longer because I have that smaller uh, time step, so it has more outputs to give. Anything else I can talk about? Well, where's orbit propagator? Oh. Let's see. All this stuff. Start. Yeah, plot codes. Oh, I also, I, I don't think I've covered this, but um, in calculate codes, there's a relative uh, codes as well. So instead of plotting just the codes value themselves, you have um, how they changed over time. So you have your initial values, 
or you have your codes and then you subtract from that um, your initial value. So you just get kind of like a delta of what your codes are instead of um, the actual raw values. And sometimes that'll make the plots look, the scales on the plots look cleaner. Um, so I, and I have this one running right now. So I set it as, um, calculate codes, codes. Oh, in the plot codes, I have rel equals true as an optional argument where it's defaulted to true. Where if it's relative for the codes, use the codes relative, and then if not, just use the regular codes that are calculated here. Yeah. Oh, I don't think I mentioned this before either, but um, this is a uh, kind of a nice little uh, thing you can do with the PLT. Um, the adjust basically they're a little bit the all the plots are a little bit too squished um, when I'm running it when I do it without this uh, W space. So W space is a pretty arbitrary number, but I just found that with a zero point three it they're spread out enough where it looks a lot better. I don't think I've covered that before, but I've always kind of had that on. Um, maybe I covered it in another video. It's been a while. It's taking so long. One thing you can do So you can um, do in the top, it kind of, it's, this is like basically running a task manager. So you can see that I have a job going with Python 3, which is what you would expect. Um, it's not using too much memory, but it's basically using a lot of the CPU. Um, where actually that isn't everything because you have multiple cores. So, and I'm going to show you the parallel as well, but um, it's a little bit misleading when it gives you that number. But okay, here it finally comes a plot. And geez, that took a long time. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be that slow on other computers, especially if they're not like hot like this. But okay, so this is the ISS. Um, what I wanted to show with this one is that these uh, kind of changes are going to be a lot different than the ones for the geostationary satellites. Um, so this is kind of what it is. Uh, it's really not a lot. Like there's a change of one degree, uh, less than one degree, inclinations by 0 0.006, uh, really not that much. Um, but then with the geo, see that calculator a lot faster. Because it's a lot less values because of the different time step. So for this geo, um, you can see that inclination changes actually a bit more, and these kind of these values change a lot more. That's a scale of like 50 degrees and uh, however much that is. But yeah, oh, it started at zero, so it got to like 100ish, and then it starts oscillating, but then dampening. Um, yep. So these are kind of what you expect to see how the inclination increased because of the inclination change, and then. I wanted to also show this orbits of the moon because it's actually, you can even see that it doesn't even, you can see how big of a difference it is even within one orbit of the moon. It's actually, it has a pretty weird orbit and maybe I'll make a video on it because it's pretty interesting, but that's just something to know. And also the scale of how far away the moon is. So that's a geostationary satellite, which is already super far away and the moon's even that much farther. And then you have to zoom really far in in order to be able to see the ISS because it's a LEO. So it's just barely above the kind of the surface there. So that's pretty much it for this video. Just want to wrap that up because that uh, running that took longer than I thought it would. Um, yeah, so that's all that. I think I covered everything that I need to. And in the next video, I'm going to just go ahead and move on to solar radiation pressure. And I'm going to do the theory first because I'm splitting them up now. So I'm going to do the solar radiation pressure theory. Um, yeah, that's it for this video. Uh, let me know anything too slow, too fast, uh, any questions. And thank you for watching.